So in this recording, we're going to examine sovereignty in a bit more depth, and in particular the Australian sovereignty story. Now you may recall the concept of Westphalian sovereignty, uh, a model that was developed from about the mid-1600 onwards, really as a means to describe the relationship and the respect that nation states had of each other. Now fundamentally in the Westphalian model, the nation state is the highest form of government. Each of the states don't necessarily have to like each other, but they at least respect the existence of each other in this model of international relations. A nation state is the highest form of government and is the, um, the monopoly of all power in terms of lawmaking over a particular region. In terms of acquisition of this power over a particular region, the Westphalian model really dictates three um, channels for doing this. The first one, I guess the most obvious, is conquest. That idea that you take your army, you go to another land, um, defeat the indigenous people or the other occupants, and you become the rulers of that land. The second is uh, session. Uh, whereby through some form of arrangement with the existing people or possibly other entities that may have already conquered a particular region, um, two nation states agree to, uh, to basically give land either as part of a swap with each other or sometimes as the result of losing, often losing a war, uh, to simply uh, sign away vast tracts of land. And the third a mechanism for acquiring sovereignty in the Westphalian model is the concept of settlement. That is, coming to uh, a tract of land that has no existing uh, claim to it. There are no, um, no other nation that lays claim over a particular area, uh, essentially land belonging to no one. Now in terms of the way the, I guess, the law um, deals with each of these um, mechanisms. Again, this is a high-level theory of international relations, but uh, in theory, a, a conquered people under this system retains the existing laws, legal systems, and structures uh, until really the conquering state decides otherwise. And you know, particularly going back in periods of time where communication models weren't as uh, robust as they are today, the act of actually expressing um, the laws of the conquering state could take significant amounts of time, effort and energy. And so the convention was when a state is conquered, then the existing laws remain uh, essentially intact. Uh, similarly, unless there has been some sort of uh, agreement or uh, express change to the contrary when uh, land is ceded from one nation to another. There, the existing laws remain, uh, again, again, unless there's been some form of active change to those circumstances. Now, the third uh, method of acquiring sovereignty, this idea of, se of settlement, um, differs from the previous two in that I guess because uh, people are coming to a land with no existing framework or um, nation states claim to it, when the people come and claim this un unused land, uh, at that point the colonizing nation's law become the law of that, uh, of that region. Now there is one I guess one sort of caveat, one precondition that must come with this third method, this idea of settlement uh, of land, it has to have no one there. <laughs> there's, there's this idea of the doctrine of terra nullius, land belonging to no one. Now, it's not strictly true that this doctrine actually expresses that there are no people there. It's that it's deemed to be unoccupied or uninhabited, um, I guess in terms of there being a competing claim of nation, of society, against uh, the incoming power. 
And this is extreme, extremely problematic in the case of Australia. You see, uh, other, um, other nations that the British Empire in the late 1700s um, were also competing to in this great race of colonialization in an effort to oh essentially establish little um, uh, little pockets of the the home nation all over the globe and one of the great difficulties uh, when coming to Australia uh, as opposed to other similar lands and again I'll use the example of New Zealand here is this idea of cultivation when uh, Cook arrived in uh, the 17, late 1760s, early 1770s, and um, an inverted commas discovered Australia. Of course, he, he hadn't discovered Australia because people had been living here for um, 40, 50,000 years, and indeed other European uh, nations, um, Tasman being the, um, the most significant of the explorers, had also sized up uh, the continent of Australia um, Although generally the Dutch had one look and, and gave it a bit of a thumbs down uh, as it was too dry and unsuitable. Um, in fact, you'll note that Tasman uh, explored the, uh, the coast of Australia and New Zealand in the uh, mid-1600s. And Cook didn't come back until, until the 17, late 1760s. So yeah, a, a very, very long period of time passed between these two explorers. One thing that is noticeable though, both Tasman and Cook made um, quite similar um, findings in terms of how they viewed the indigenous peoples of each of the two, uh, well you know, now the two countries of New Zealand and Australia, in that the Europeans when coming to New Zealand could see um, an established uh, agrarian society. They were greeted with uh, indifference to Cook and, and violence to Tasman, but regardless of that, the European uh, explorers of the time recognised that the people of New Zealand, the indigenous people, cultivated the land. They had structured uh, systems of agriculture and uh, ways of utilising and modifying the land. Um, the creation of uh, forts and fortresses and having structures um, and generally <laughs> engaging in systematic warfare um, and these sort of features are really the hallmarks of I guess of civilization and it's important to note in relation to land that the European I guess the Eurocentric thinking behind this is that look land for as long as um, the various sort of European powers had, had viewed it is really the source of food and it's this ability to cultivate the land and create food and really to create an excess of food to be able to facilitate um, structured and systemic warfare meant that land and land owning and controlling it was really a source of power and so it's important for us to note here that this control of the land and the cultivation of the land is really something that forms the the framework of our of our legal system because that's where the power flows from and so again this the european view then is that well syst systems that don't have agriculture don't have the corresponding power um, that flows from that and really the results of this is that there is no apparent government or legal system that, that, is, that follows as a direct result of having this structure in place. It's a very important consideration and again it's helpful to think in terms of the I guess the European views of the two countries, the peoples of indigenous peoples of Australia and of New Zealand um, because certainly at the uh, these initial stages they're looking at it and looking at these systems and coming to two quite different conclusions about the peoples and really about the legal system that exists in each of those countries at that time. And so this is really problematic in terms of Australia because under I guess the um, those methods of acquiring sovereignty in the Westphalian model, 
uh, Australia's sovereignty story is grounded in the idea that this was an uncultivated land. There was no existing system of land use, and as such, there was no recognisable system of law. That's not to say that there weren't people there, but the British, in terms of um, establishing a legal system in Australia, pretty much discounted all of the uh, existing customary laws and uh, systems that Indigenous Australians had and had did have in place for, um, you know, for many tens of thousands of years. And so these features, and I guess this difficulty, this dissonance between um, the underlying sovereignty story that Australia is settled because it is terra nullius and belongs to no one, and the, I guess, the reality of there being peoples with systems and structures is something that um, very much forms a, a large part of Australian legal history. And, and as such, I'll spend a bit of time here just going through some of the, um, I guess, some of the core cases to really uh, help us get a get an understanding of where where it sits at the moment. When we're looking at the underlying legal history of Australia, it may be helpful to just examine the instructions given to the British uh, naval captains uh, who were to set out and negotiate and deal with the indigenous peoples. And, and certainly, uh, Captain Cook was given license uh, and sort of strict instructions to when he came to the South Pacific to, well, gain the consent of natives and try wherever possible um, to try and take and, ta and claim land uh, in the name of the king. Uh, similarly, Governor um, uh, Philip, when sending, when being sent off with the first first fleet, um, was instructed to conciliate the affection of the indigenous peoples uh, in order to coexist, to live in amity and kindness with them. And so, as a starting point for examining uh, Terra Nullius, this idea that you know, there were no people there, this land is has no one in it, was, was clearly false, um, I guess, uh, from the outset, in terms of there being people as such. Um, and so really, it's then uh, something that the courts and court system inside Australia have had to wrestle with over the last uh, few centuries, because it's a fundamental foundational basis to Australian sovereignty. Whether or not this was some form of um, uh, sort of innocent mistake, oh, hey, our system of law is based on this idea that there was no existing legal system structure or nation, um, or was it just something that was convenient for the uh, for the colonizers? Hey, look, Australia is a is a long way from Britain, and indeed from all of the other major centres of uh, of great civilization in the world at the time, is it something that they just used, I, I guess, as something of an excuse in order to just um, to justify uh, the taking of land and establishing of, uh, of the British sovereignty across the entire continent. So in examining the doctrine of terra nullius uh, in the courts and court system um, post uh, First Fleet, um, it may be helpful to start with MacDonald and Levy. That's a case from 1833, and in particular the judgment that comes from the Chief Justice Forbes. Um, and there, in MacDonald, the case, I guess the, the primary issue, was to do with whether a statute passed in the early 1800s uh, restricting the rate of interest uh, in England, a statute under the reign of, of Queen Anne, whether or not that was actually valid in Australia. And the Chief Justice, what uh, he did in, in Macdonald and Levy, was to really go through and, and examine how these um, these sorts of laws operated, not just in terms of England and uh, the colony of New South Wales at the time, but also in other uh, territories that formed part of the British Empire. And in particular, he, he noted the difference between uh, settled colonies, in other words, where there was effectively no people, such as Barbados, um, and places such as Jamaica, where uh, there was an existing system of government, Spanish in that case. And so 
And he also examined uh, the timelines of each of these, whether or not um, they actually occurred before um, uh, the idea of Westphalian sovereignty really uh, developed. And so what the Chief Justice uh, found in that case is that, look, this particular statute um, doesn't apply in the case of, um, of New South Wales at the time, um, largely because the local legislature didn't actually make any laws to go and change. But, uh, importantly, the existing people didn't have any form of existing government. They're what they did. They had no indicia of or um, uh, or any uh, anything that demonstrated that they were a civilization and that there were existing structures and laws in order for um, the British courts to draw uh, or try to infer this particular um, legal concept from. Now, Macdonald and Levy was, was um, held and analysed uh, according to the, uh, the Supreme Court of the then quite, um, quite small colony of New South Wales. It was dealt entirely within the colonial court system. Uh, drawing your attention to the next case of Cooper and Stewart, that was actually a case that went on appeal from uh, the courts of New South Wales to the Privy Council in the United Kingdom. And there, uh, the Privy Council uh, explained in, in generous depth about the difference between the three types of acquiring uh, sovereignty under the Westphalian model. And they didn't, didn't use that particular term, but they did explain that this third type, this idea of settlement, is really to do with law. And, um, again, according to the Privy Council, the colony of New South Wales did not have inhabitants that had settled law. It was practically unoccupied. And I guess this, uh, I guess what we might call a legal fiction, this idea that there were no existing people with uh, systems or structures that were recognised, um, is something that pervaded for quite a long time. And it really wasn't until after uh, the end of the Second World War, where there was much more, um, uh, the world was going through this uh, uh, process of decolonialization. And there was much more willingness to recognise, um, I guess, the rights of Indigenous peoples the world over. However, it, it took a very long time in the Australian legal system for this to really sort of bear much fruit. Um, now, for example, the, uh, I guess, important case of Mrapulam and Nabalco, this was also referred to as the Gove Peninsula case, where a group of Indigenous people sought an injunction against uh, an aluminium smelter that had been granted by the federal government. And there, the justice of the federal court was very, very sympathetic towards um, the applicants. They said, look, the, you've clearly demonstrated, and really it had become quite popular uh, knowledge, that there was uh, a system of government in place, and that the peoples, you know, the hundreds of 700 different indigenous groups separated, uh, spread across the Australian continent demonstrated social order and structure um, and uh, he had a, a great line towards the end if ever a system could be called a government of laws and not of men it was shown on the evidence uh, adduced uh, before him and this was important because it demonstrated that while there wasn't the systematic uh, agriculture that which had been evident in other civilizations around the world, there was certainly this idea of structure and I think importantly the idea that individuals were subject to a higher power and that each was subject, and this sounds a little bit familiar, each uh, person was subject to the law, the law that had been gathered and, and maintained uh, through custom. Justice Blackburn, however, did feel that uh, his hands were tied on the matter and that in his judgment while he was sympathetic he still uh, didn't recognize that there was any form of a pre-existing native title 
the the particular uh, the appellants in this case could actually bring about a particular uh, claim. In other words, there was no underlying legal justification for their claim, which could be recognised in the system, and so uh, this particular application was refused in that case. Now, while the Gove Peninsula case was heard by the federal court, uh, an application a few years later, sort of eight years later, uh, was heard in front of the full High Court uh, in the case of Coe and the Commonwealth. Now, Coe was much more ambitious than previous cases. Um, there, the the plaintiff, Mr. Coe, claimed that, I guess, from time immemorial, prior to James Cook arriving, that the indigenous peoples enjoyed sovereignty across the entire continent. Um, this is problematic, as one um, you know, might uh, rightly see, in that the applicant, uh, again, when completing the form, was largely rejected on, um, on I guess, on procedural grounds. And partially, the court, and certainly um, uh, Justice Jacobs, invoked what's called the Act of State Doctrine, basically that a court doesn't have any power to somehow overthrow or overturn the power that validly appointed it. It's essentially a circular argument. You can't exercise power to remove the power that granted you the power to exercise it in the first place. And so essentially uh, what the judge is saying is that, look, you can't go to the High Court to bring about this action. If you want to bring it about, you have to do it in an international court. An internal or a domestic court exercising its jurisdiction can't challenge the underlying sovereignty of that jurisdiction. Now again, it may be worth noting uh, in particular the judgment of Justice Murphy in that case. Again, the judge is extremely sympathetic towards, uh, I guess, the idea that there, there definitely were people who existed in this land, that when they had complex systems of law, and there were, um, I guess, mechanics of governance that existed, even if, I guess, those arriving with a Eurocentric view couldn't recognize that in the time, at the time. Um, again, he was sympathetic towards the cause, but uh, essentially deferred to, um, to the others to say that, look, we can't, we can't allow this particular matter because we don't have the power to. And so I turn finally to the case of Marbo and Queensland, number two, from 1992. Now this case, is, as well as being a, um, a fundamentally important landmark case uh, in the history of Australian sovereignty, it's also very close to, uh, to us here at JCU. Uh, the, the plaintiff, um, Eddie Marbo, was from the Torres Strait, but he was actually worked uh, as a gardener and, and part-time teacher uh, here at uh, James Cook University um, and had attended um, certain land right, uh, lands rights conferences uh, organised at JCU and the Townsville Treaty Committee in the early 80s. And in fact, uh, his interest in this actually flowed from conversations that he'd had with two of the uh, then history lecturers here, Henry Reynolds and, and Noel Luce. And so it's, um, it's a case of great significance that uh, it's very close to our hearts. Now, as you may or may not be aware, in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s in Queensland, uh, there was a very uh, strong premier by the name of Joe Bjerke Peterson. And, um, and Queensland, the Queensland government at the time uh, was really reacting to what seemed to be this undercurrent, this sentiment, um, as I'd alluded to er earlier, that your judges um, such as Lionel Murphy in Co and uh, Justice Blackburn in Mirapulam and Nabalco had really alluded to, and incidentally other cases in other jurisdictions such as Canada um, had actually been found to the, uh, to, the, um, to the applicant's favour in a lot of these matters in that um, native title could actually be sourced, even in situations where the Crown had deemed it to be extinguished. And so the Queensland government at the time passed some legislation uh, to basically to just 
uh, expressed that native title didn't really exist and that the, the, the Crown had radical title uh, across everywhere within the jurisdiction of the state of Queensland. And in Mabo No. 1, the applicants there, um, Mabo and Co actually succeeded in that they managed to strike down that legislation on the basis, though, a really a legal, technical basis, that it was inconsistent with the Racial Discrimination Act. Here, though, in Mabo No. 2, the applicants were you know, directly trying to establish that there was native to land. Um, it put for an argument that where um, traditional title had been extinguished, so in other words, where the state government had come along and kicked people off their land, that there could that could give rise to a claim in compensation. Now, the first part, in terms of, uh, I, I guess, following along the same reasoning as the case in Co, to do with the active state doctrine. Um, and that uh, was sort of clearly mapped out uh, here to really just reinforce this idea that, look, it's an issue of international law if you're trying to determine what the underlying sovereignty of a particular nation is, particularly when you're going through the court system. Those courts can't go about changing or modifying the underlying sovereignty of a particular nation that gives rise to the power, um, that in, the, in our case, from the from the Commonwealth Constitution that gives uh, powers to the court in the first place. What six of the seven judges did do, however, was to recognise that the common law of Australia does actually recognise native title. And now, they did express this in, I guess, a very, um, very tentatively, in that, yes, in Australia, the common law recognises native title, but only where it hasn't been extinguished. And this, I guess, the idea of um, the, the applicants in this case being people that have that continuous connection to the island of Mer, to the Murray Islands and the Torres Strait, uh, that their land entitlement has, um, has survived the chain of title, I guess, has survived prior to 1770. Uh, and as such, uh, the, the applicants in that case can express that because the Crown hasn't actually come and forcibly expressed a desire to take over that particular land. It hasn't been extinguished. And I guess in terms of where we are in sovereignty, this is a massive thing. This is, I mean, basically, going back to the underlying notion that Australia was, uh, you know, the sovereignty was asserted through settlement and because the land was terra nullius and belonged to no one, and this really overturned that as being essentially a legal fiction. Look, there were laws, there were customs, there were traditions, there were people with ties to the land, and the common law recognises that, and the courts within the structure of the Australian legal system can recognise that pre-existing um, traditions and, and claims and usage to the land, but in a very weak way. And importantly, the native title being, I guess, a very, very weak form of title and that it can be very easily extinguished, um, both by, uh, I guess, expressed uh, acts of the Crown to literally come and kick people off the land, um, and also by, um, by others coming along and removing people. And what was important is that while uh, the Marbo decision was uh, six to one in establishing that there was native title, um, there wasn't a clear majority uh, expressing that this um, extinguishment of native title would give rise to compensation. In other words, three judges thought that they could give that right, but um, the majority did not. And so, uh, and I guess that's something that um, that's of much more contemporary relevance to us. The idea is that how for Indigenous people, particularly who've been very much um, wrongfully removed from traditional land, um, you know, whether there is some form of compensation uh, through the common law that can be used to address that. And the answer at that stage is still not clear. Um, but certainly, it's a very, very important to note uh, Marbo as, I guess, the um, turning point in recognition of native title in Australia. Now, um, 
the, at a subsequent stage, of course, very soon afterwards, the the government of the day was sort of faced with a bit of a choice, um, and that they chose to really to just to just go with it. Okay, this is what the courts um the courts held. Let's enact a native title act, um, really to regulate that. Okay, we accept that native title can exist in Australia. How do people go about doing it? Um, what body are we going to establish to um, to really look after this area? What forms are people going to have to fill in? What are the mechanics of that? Really to flesh it out. And it's a good example, by the way, of really the um, the separation between, uh, I guess, the role of the courts to um, uh, to really apply and from time to time declare what the law is um, in Parliament to really map out um, occasionally to overrule if they didn't like a particular decision and certainly uh, most commentators would say that if the government of the day really didn't um, want to go with this decision that it it would have been possible for them to legislate to, um, to overturn it and but they didn't uh, they didn't, and so that this idea of um, the ability to, to claim uh, native title uh, entitlements flows from the Mabo Number no. Two decision, and is now enshrined in the in the Native Title Act. And so, really, that's where we are now. That idea that look, the courts can't fundamentally change the nature or the of the the power that gives them their authority to make decisions. That's an active state. That's a matter for an international law. And so, notwithstanding that the land wasn't um, unoccupied when Cook arrived in, in 1770, the courts can't change that. They can't modify that underlying sovereignty story. It's a bit awkward in that they described, then described peoples with long-standing customs and traditions that d that predated 1770 and recognize this in such a way that well we can say well look you can actually claim native title from that and but it's very very hard to do actually going through and making a native title claim is very very difficult largely because it can so easily be extinguished the crown can come in its various forms federal or state and extinguish um, native title and it can do so by statute um, and so that does leave us with a situation where um, the federal and most of the state governments um, map out the um, generally the relationship between uh, indigenous landowners and um, various government departments and in particular um, departments that deal with the usage of land and they, um, there are certain statutory obligations that uh, various government bodies and private citizens must must have, which really involve uh, indigenous uh, landowners um, to take part in decisions. These things are governed by statute. But nonetheless, Mabo was a very, very uh, significant uh, part of the Australian sovereignty story and of legal history.